talk, which is going to be very informal, let me just apologize for my general advance, is is called it's going to be called uh, Beyond Reading Like a Writer, or what I should have written instead of reading like a writer, or what I should have written in addition to reading like a writer, or what I would have what would have happened if I'd written something besides reading like a writer. <laughs> so uh, in order to do that, maybe I should talk a little about reading like a writer and how that got written and then go on and, and talk about the rest. Uh, some of you may know the book, but uh, but I want to talk about what it is and and how it began. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? I can remember the, the exact moment when I decided to write the book. I was giving uh, a reading in southern Mississippi, and, and before the reading, I talked to a group of graduate students, and there was a Q and I did a so-called master class, and then there was a Q&A after the class. And uh, the student said to me, uh, so what are you reading now? And, and often when people ask me that, I can just feel every, brain, every book I've ever read just Vanished. But I happen to remember, and I, I was reading uh, *Crime and Punishment* in preparation, really, or as a kind of research for a book that never got written. And and I said, I'm reading this yesterday. I'm reading *Crime and Punishment*. And there was complete silence in the room. Now I should say these were MFA students. These were these were future writers. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And I said, Dostoevsky. <laughs> and they looked at me, and, and I said, and just out of curiosity, I said, well, okay, so how many of you have read anything by Dostoevsky? Nothing. No. And I said, Crime and Punishment, nothing. So, um, and that seemed a little weird to me, that, that they were writers. They wanted to be writers and had read nothing by Dostoevsky. So, so then I began this kind of impromptu rant about the Russians and why it was so important. And, and at some point, somebody said to me, one of the kids said to me, um, can you spell Turgenev? <laughs> so, um, so I, so I thought I'd write a book about about how <laughs> I'm glad. So uh, about how I learned to write. I mean, I myself did not go through an MFA program. I I did not have graduate education in writing. I learned to write, insofar as I learned by reading, and I learned by reading really great books and and studying them and reading them slowly. So, so reading like a writer evolved as a kind of alternative, really, alternative suggestion for how to learn to write uh, as an alternative to the workshop system, which is, as many of you know, is, you know, a, a student will bring a story in and everyone will say what they like and what they don't like and, and so forth. And I never really went through that. I learned by just reading literature and trying to figure out how the writers had done what they did in, in these books. And, and it's the way, I, you know, I have to say, it's an ongoing process. I mean, it, I'm, I still feel like I'm learning all the time. And I'm still learning in the same way. I mean, that is, uh, if I have a problem in my own work, I, I know by now who does the thing I'm trying to do, who does it really well. So so what I tell students is, is to have a kind of we used to say Rolodex. I mean, there probably aren't any, you know, whatever the equivalent is. Uh, in your mind, of, of which writers do which things well, and you know, if you're going to try and write a party scene, read, for example, Anna Karenina, which has some of the greatest party scenes ever written, or James Joyce's The Dead, and so forth. So you can learn by reading to be a writer. So, so that's what reading like a writer is, and it, and it also suggests close reading, which is slowing down and reading word by word, line by line, phrase by phrase, which is the way I teach. I mean, I don't teach writing anymore by choice. I teach literature classes, and I teach mostly undergraduates. I teach at Bard College. And what we do in class is just read a text in that way, word by word, line by line. We hardly ever get through more than three or four pages of a story in two hours. And, and I tell my students, Okay, this is going to be the most tedious class you've ever taken, you know. But it isn't because what we're talking about is language and, and word choice and punctuation and why a writer uses one word instead of another and how information is communicated in the way a writer, a writer of fiction, mostly does. So, uh, so consequently, reading like a writer. So the book came out, and and in my mind, the book was written for. Um, 
you know, 14 or 15 desperate MFA instructors across the country. <laughs> desperate in the same way I did. I mean, desperate, you know, trying to sell students on the idea that reading was important, that you would actually want to read if you wanted to be a writer. And, and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's such a kind of hard sell that, that maybe they would want me on their side. I mean, that is, you know, they stated their students. And, and this has happened to me. Um, it's very demoralizing to try and convince students that there's some reason to read if you want to be a writer, or especially some reason to read a writer who's dead. I mean, that seems to be particularly hard to convince people. You know. uh, and, and it often happens, especially in MFA program, programs, that students are much more interested in reading writers whom they know has just gotten a huge advance for a new novel, rather than you know, Chekhov, who they don't know what advanced Chekhov got, so my mom. So, um, so, so, so my idea, and I should say my publisher's idea about reading like a writer was that these 15 desperate teachers would buy the book and maybe read it in their classes. Well, it turned out that there were more than 15 desperate teachers, and um, and I should say that the first printing of Reading Like a Writer represented everybody's idea that it was for these 15 <coughs> teachers. And, and suddenly, everyone seemed to be, want to read this book. Um, I was shocked. My publishers were shocked. None of us expected us, it to be a bestseller. But it, as I began to tour for the book and read from the book, uh, it became clear to me that, that there was something, what do I want to say, slightly I mean, reading like a writer, in a way, I wished I'd called it reading like a reader, or reading like a human being, or reading like <laughs> a person. Because, uh, because reading like a writer had a kind of, what do I, it has a sort of multitasking aspect to it, which seemed very American to me. I mean, that is, it wasn't just reading for joy, or pleasure, or enjoyment, or happiness. It was reading for an, an aim you know, like a writer, that is, reading for people who wanted to be writers. And in fact, as I, you know, when I was touring for the book, I was, on the one hand, very moved by how many people were readers and came up to me and said, you know, your book has really, you know, taught me about books that I haven't read, that I want to read. The book has a reading list at the end of 118 books we read immediately. You know, books that <laughs> I want to read. But, but it was also clear to me that people were reading my book because they wanted to write a book, that it wasn't really about reading as a reader, it was about reading to become a writer, that it had a kind of and, you know, a, a purpose beyond reading. So, so that's why, as I said, I wanted to talk about reading beyond reading like a writer. And so in the last couple of days, I was just jotting down other reasons why we read besides the desire to become a writer. And there are certainly, you know, many other reasons. So, um, so here they go. One of them, I mean, the first one, and this was, this was why I, you know, I was trying to think back, why did I become a reader? Why did I first fall in love with reading? And, and that is reading for escape. I mean, that seems to me, the, you know, a very basic and a very honorable reading, reason to read. Uh, I often say, joking around, but I'm not really joking around, that I write for people <coughs> who are on airplanes and in dentist's office waiting rooms. I mean, that is people who don't want to be where they are and who want a book to take them out of where they are and take them someplace else. Uh, when I was a kid, I think that was the main reason I read, was not to be where I was. Uh, looking back, it seems to me I had sort of a happy child, I mean, certainly a protected childhood. But, um, but I read to get out of where I was. I mean, my parents were both very hardworking, and they had this idea that when they weren't working, uh, I would want to be with them. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, now as a parent, I realize, you know, the touching, how touching that was, but the insane folly of it. <laughs> so, um, so we would take these family vacations or, you know, cross, I remember one particularly 